Maybe? All right, so we'll just uh, take a minute to reconnect with our motivation. So just for a minute, shift your focus to the breath. And just watch the breath without blocking thoughts, without encouraging thoughts, without narrating over the top of your thoughts. Just let them be and watch the breath. Okay. Just have a quick question. Yep. Um, is there a, is, is there is a connection, and what is the connection to the wheel of life to the twelve links in a time of death? Yeah, um, the link of becoming is the discussion on what to do at the time of death. So the link of becoming will go into that for sure. Yep. Remind me if I forget. But yeah, okay. yeah, there's a lot there. For sure. Um, yeah, um, miscellaneous questions before we go on to the next section. If you're embarrassed, you can put it in the chat if you like. Okay. <clears throat> so um, we're going to go into the um, the central area, kind of the the pie of it. Um, this uh, it's five quadrants, but it's six realms um, because the demigod and god realm share a realm. Yeah, so sometimes it's divided into six and sometimes it's five with one of them being a little bit bigger. Um, so the god and demigod realm is um, up towards the top. So um, this, this is a really interesting conversation for us to look at in terms of just our human lived experience, as well as to look at in terms of samsara, literally or metaphorically, however you like. But basically each of these realms has a dominant delusion. Yeah, you know, most of the realms have any number of delusions that can arise, especially the human realm. We have the whole spectrum, the whole Balagant. But um, the, each of the realms kind of has their main go-to affliction. So if we look at the God realm, which is at the top, um, which uh, has uh, the people right next to them who are like shooting arrows at them, and those are the demigods. Basically, gods and demigods, their dom dominant affliction is pride and jealousy. So for gods, the, the dominant delusion is pride. For demigods, the dominant delusion is jealousy. And I think this is really interesting because if we think about how these realms are described, they're places of pleasure. They're places of pleasure and ease, where material resources come very quickly, uh, very easily. Um, they have, uh, you know, health and happiness and beauty and basically everything they need um, in terms of worldly happiness. And so that makes us say, okay, so if we had everything we ever wanted, what would be the most natural affliction? Pride, right? And then look at your own human existence, because I think all of us are wealthy enough to have broadband. <laughs> We're wealthy enough to have laptop computers. Um, so we all have a level of um, financial stability and a level of like material comfort, which means that um, for us, perhaps our dominant affliction could be pride or jealousy, <laughs> right? Pride about who we are and what we have, or um, pride about who we are and what we have, but comparing it to people that have a little bit more and being jealous about that. This is kind of us, yeah? This is, you know, I don't know, middle class, upper middle class, wealthy people problems, yeah? Um, of course, poor people can be proud as well, right? It can happen to anyone. But I think it's really interesting to look at 
What afflictions are most dominant when you're suffering in a coarse way? What afflictions are most dominant when things are half-half? And what afflictions are dominant when things are really easy? Um, and do you, if you just kind of think about your observation of life, do you think it's the case that when you are well off or other people are well off or think of themselves as that, that pride comes more easily? Yeah, pride meaning looking down on others. Yeah, seeing, you know, seeing yourself as somehow a bit superior. Um, this can happen really easily when things are going well. And when things are going well, it's very easy to forget how you wound up that way and to judge other people who haven't gotten their act together, right? So say that you are very um, responsible and wise with your money management and you don't have tons of debt or you've managed your debt in a way that is uh, functional and you know, you're working through it and it's going okay. If you have a friend who is just like stupid with money, right? They make it and they lose it and they make it and they lose it and they could have lots more stability and security if they would only manage it properly. It's not that they don't have a good income, it's that they're dumb with the income that they have. And you really look down on them because you are practical with your money, right? It can happen really naturally. Whereas if you're the one who um, got stuck in a, in a bit of a debt spiral, if you made some um, foolish decisions about your money, if something dramatic happened where you lost a lot of money and it was out of your control, then if you have a friend who is in a similar state, you don't judge them, do you? You think, yeah, I get it, right? Some of these things are out of our control. Some of these things just happen. We don't have all the information or we make choices that we then regret because we didn't know enough. Or sometimes we're just distracted or careless or whatever, it happens, of course, it's human. So you meet another friend who's going through some sort of financial hardship and you're not looking down on them because you know that suffering. But when you don't know that suffering or you've forgotten that suffering, you sort of look down like, you poor fool, how did you get yourself into that? Yeah, which is, you know, completely blocks your empathy, completely blocks your compassion. It's so easy to forget what it was like when things were harder and how, um, how, how much more easily negative states of mind arose and how once you make one bad decision, it's easier to make another bad decision and another bad decision. Yeah, Noah wants to ask a question. Yeah, so um, personally, I feel like um like it's two different things i mean you have pride and then you have judgment and i totally agree with what you said about judgment i mean people are very quick to judge others that are in situations um that they might not know themselves but they feel like they do um but when it comes to pride i actually feel like it's the opposite that the more well off you are um the more well off people are i feel that um, their heart opens more and that they're not as attached to their pride. Um, while when people don't, like when they feel don't have enough, when it's something that's more like threatened, I'd say, um, then like they're more attached to their pride. Yeah, I think, I think you're quite right. It can go that direction as well. Absolutely. It, it's more about like, what do the conditions leave an opening for? Not that they have to. So it's just like, you know, in the um, animal realm, the dominant delusion is ignorance, but that doesn't mean that all animals are stupid. You know, you look at some very smart dolphins, right? Um, in the God realm, it's like the opening is there for a lot of pride to arise. It doesn't mean that it necessarily does, but it's the one thing that it does do is that when we have lots of pleasure, it's harder to remember the impact of suffering. Not impossible, but the more pleasure we have, the harder it is to remember what happens when you're struggling and then to want to work for the benefit of others who are struggling. So it kind of shuts off your compassion a little bit if you don't have any struggle. So it's not like we wanna seek struggle, right? We're human beings, we have plenty of struggle. We don't need to go looking for more struggle but to remind ourselves that when things are going pretty easily for us, we um, are much more likely to judge people 
that it's not going easy for them because we don't remember how hard it was for us in difficult times. You know, it's like our memory gets kind of sugar coated and we think, yeah, things were tough, but I got through it. They can get through it. Why don't they just get themselves together? Why don't they just get organized? Right? We, we forget what it was like and how um, easily pulled into drama you are when you're already struggling, how easily pulled into bad decisions you are when you're already struggling, and how the nature of afflictions is that they make the mind unpeaceful. If you've got afflictions plus suffering, the mind is way too agitated for the wisdom to be driving. And so you make poor choices. So then if you're not as afflicted, then you're less likely to make bad choices. If you're not as suffering, you're not as likely to make bad choices. And so you do get the case where there's um, like benevolent rich people, you know, or um, philanthropists or people that once they're stable, once they're financially confident, they don't want to do anything except be generous. You know, they want to be generous and they want to help and they create charities and they're kind to their neighbors and they're just warm and abundant because they so much want to soothe the poverty of the world or of their society. Absolutely, that's the case for a lot of people. And together with that can also be pride right? You are the grand savior of the universe because you're the magic one that has your finances together. You know, it's not like you put it in those words, but it can be the, the pride that looks down on people that says, how did you get yourself into that mess? Or it can be the pride that says, I'll help you because I'm better, right? You don't say those words. It's an attitude, right? It's an attitude of superiority. And um, usually you can tell if you've fallen into it yourself, if you're trying to be of benefit to someone and they don't respond the way you wanted them to respond. So if you are trying to help someone and it doesn't work or they don't care or um, it doesn't land the right way and your reaction is, oh, well, I tried anyway, I wish them well, you probably weren't as afflicted. If your reaction is, how dare they not appreciate me? then your pride probably was driving. So sometimes it's hard to know if um, compassion was driving or if pride was driving until you see the reaction of the other. But if you like the reaction, um, you know, sometimes that's a sign that your pride is really happy. Like, look, I helped. I helped, <laughs> right? I, the grand savior of the universe. Yeah. Is it so, liking, sorry, yeah. in, in that case, is it necessarily pride? Is it more like I can say that I often feel that way. Like it's very important to me to feel like I helped. And I feel like for me, it's more like in the sense of something along the lines of purpose, I guess. Just like knowing that I make a good contribution to the world. That I don't just like walk around and waste my life and whatever. Um, yeah, absolutely. Not, yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily pride. I mean, absolutely, we want to feel meaning and purpose and connection. Absolutely. We need that and we should seek that meaning, purpose, connection, benefit. But what I'm talking about is when it doesn't work, what is your reaction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when you're oriented with bodhicitta, for example, or if you're oriented with compassion, for example, the work itself is a good enough reason to do it whether it's immediately effective or just effective for your own mental development, the work itself is a good enough reason to do it. So then when it, you know, is successful or not, that's incidental. If it works mm -hmm. and you are helpful in a really obvious immediate way, that's like a bonus. It's not the point. And you have enough humility that realizes that even if someone says you've been helpful, doesn't mean it was the most helpful thing because you don't know all the details. So it could have been instant gratification help, but actually wind up being enabling, for example. So mm -hmm. with, with humility, you can just be happy that your motivation is altruistic, but you have enough humility that knows, I don't really get all the conditions. I don't really know all of the, the things that are going to impact from my choices. So I'm just going to keep doing the best I can and letting go. Do the best you can, let it go. Do the best you can, let it go. Because even something that looks successful might actually ultimately be damaging. Something that looks damaging might ultimately be successful. We don't have enough awareness. All we can do is organize our own motivation. 
you know, so this God realm, the main teaching of looking at the God realm and the demigod realm is to make sure that we don't get drunk with pleasure so that it blocks our compassion. Yeah, we can experience pleasure, we can enjoy our pleasure, we can fully lean into it, but with this idea of sharing, yeah, and this idea that understands cause and effect, that the reason you're experiencing happiness and pleasure is through the ripening result of previous moments of positive actions. The very fact that you were able to do positive actions is because of the support and learning you received from others. So it's like you don't own anything. Yeah, everything is shared already. So when you experience the result of something that came about through shared work, you share it back out rather than thinking all this pleasure and resources arrived here with me and it's mine and I'll keep it. You know, forgetting that the only reason you know how to do positive actions is somebody taught you. The only reason you could do positive actions is that there were other people to do positive actions towards, et cetera, et cetera, right? So nothing is standing alone. So then there's no reason to get egocentric about it. It doesn't make sense. Because the same goes for negative things too, right? If you did something really negative and now you're experiencing a negative result, that also doesn't stand alone. You didn't do that all by yourself. So there's no reason to identify with yourself as a bad person just because you're suffering. So it goes both ways, right? I don't know if that, does that make sense? Yeah, slowly, slowly, <laughs> slowly, slowly. But I, I think that um, whether you believe literally in the God and demigod realms or whether you look at them metaphorically, the, the teaching is to look at when I have pleasure, what is my response to it? And can my response be immediately gratitude, sharing, connection, as opposed to, I'm only entitled. It's only right that I have it. It's mine. I'll deign to share it when I feel like it, like a king from the top of the hill. No, you know, that's not what we want to get into. When we have pleasure, we need to remember where it came from and how to share it. Um, the God realm is a really interesting one to explore because we tell ourselves all these lies about our practice. One of the lies we tell ourselves is when life is less busy, when life is less stressful, then I'll practice. That's a big fat lie because when life is less busy and life is less stressful, usually you relax into some sort of indulgence and you, um, you, know, you become even more lazy and even less engaged with your practice. Probably you practice the best when things are hard because you have some motivation to, right? You're having some big relationship breakdown. You just lost your job. You've got the coronavirus, whatever. You're like, oh crap, what can I do? I have to practice, you know? You're busier and more conflicted than ever, but actually you want to practice. But the lie we tell ourselves is when things are easier, then I'll get around to it. Oh, when I'm retired, then I'll get around to it. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Maybe you'll just go on a holiday around the world and see different variations of samsara and then die. You know, like really, what are you gonna do with your free time? Usually with free time, we become less efficient, not more. Not always, sometimes you're well organized with your free time. But to remember that it's, it's not the case that a less stressful life equals more ease in practice. Sometimes a stressful life means you have the motivation to practice and you go more deeply. Yeah. So I had a, um, I had a friend, a really dear friend um, who I've known for about 10 years, who was about 65. And um, we used to have these great Dharma conversations about when she retires, she's gonna turn her house, she's got a big house, she's gonna turn it into a Dharma center. When she retires, she's going to turn the house into a Dharma center. So right now, um, the spare space in her house, she did uh, like Airbnb. And when I'd visit Australia, I'd go stay at her Airbnb. And, um, and we'd talk about, oh, the living room, we could make into a gompa this way. Oh, look at the backyard. We could put a stupa there. Oh, and we had all these fun talks about what we'll do when she retires and how we're going to make it into a beautiful Dharma center. And then uh, two weeks ago, she died at 65, right? So she never got to retire, right? She never got to make her Dharma center. It just, you know, all the plans came to naught and all the putting off of practice came to naught. You know, she didn't think she would die at 65. Probably none of us think we're gonna die at 65. 
but there, done. Um, and I think that's something to remember in terms of clarifying priorities. Yeah, if this was my last week, what activities would naturally fall away because they simply don't matter? And what activities would get a lot more um, energy? What activities would get a lot more joy because you realize how incredibly temporary this life is? Yeah, remembering death can make life so much more joyful because the little things simply don't matter. Yeah, you think, okay, well, I was going to renovate the kitchen, but actually death is coming, so maybe I'll just leave it. It's not leaking, it's fine, right? <laughs> I was going to renovate the kitchen, but now is that really how I want to live my life? Yeah, do I want to spend my last week retiling? You know, maybe you do because it's an excuse to hang out with your friends and family and make something beautiful. And maybe you don't because it was just an ego trip so that your neighbors wouldn't look down on you for having old fashioned tiles. You know, so again, it's not about the activity, it's about the motivation you're bringing to it. But, but to ask ourselves these kind of questions of, um, if I knew death was coming this week, what would I naturally stop doing? And what would I do more of? Yeah, and of the pleasure I have right now, how would I use it in a way that is um, connection and sharing and enriching as opposed to just kind of raw indulgence blobbing out, you know, draining the bank account of my positive karma. Yeah. So, um, so the God and demigod realms are, are interesting to think about because basically if you think of them literally, they're just riding the wave of past work not creating much more new good karma. So some of them were amazing meditators. Some of them were um, amazing philanthropists. People in the God realms have done amazing positive actions and now they're reaping the reward of that, but it's still within samsara. So they're just riding the wave of old stuff, not creating new, which means eventually they're gonna go straight down to the pits, right? Straight down to the most suffering states and they'll still have some tendencies of altruism and some tendencies of meditation, but they will have forgotten so much. So, you know, I think that um, when we're remembering joy and pleasure and all of these good things that we want to keep using it in a practice way, otherwise we're going to run out. Yeah, it is like a bank account in a lot of ways. Um, maybe in this life, some of us have had spontaneous, interesting meditations, where you sat down to meditate on something simple like the breath or the mind, and then without much effort at all, all sorts of interesting things started happening with your chakras, and all sorts of bliss started to flood your body, or interesting connections happened in your mind, or all sorts of kind of magic, cool things happened. And you think, I am a great meditator. And then the next week you tried to meditate and it was like a struggle just to stay with the breath for more than 20 seconds. This shows us that maybe we were a great meditator eons ago, but we don't remember how, yeah? So it's actually not that big a deal. It's like, oh crap, I used to know how to do this. Now I don't remember. I'm gonna to have to start from scratch. So in a way it's like, oh, it's good news you've done this before, but in a way it's bad news because it's like you reached a really high state, but it was so long ago, you don't remember how anyway. Now you have to start from scratch. Do we wanna keep doing that? You know, working hard, figuring out new techniques, achieving a real high level of realization, and then just basking in the enjoyment of that burning through our merit and then crash back down to a level where we can't do it anymore. Yeah. So there's just kind of interesting things to sit with, right? Um, okay, so then the human realm, this is what we know, right? This is the dominant disturbing emotion is desirous attachment. It's basically, it's not like we want to be happy, it's that we want to be happier, 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 right? We're happy-ish. <laughs> Yeah, we're happy-ish, but we want to be happier all the time. And, um, you know, you get a little bit of happiness and you just want more. It's like drinking salt water, right? Your thirst is never quenched. And for us in the, in the desire realm, particularly, which includes the human realm, if you think about even something like anger, desire is at the root of it. All of our other negative states of mind for human beings 
I would say 90% of the time, you can trace back the source to attachment. So say you're angry and you think, well, what does this have to do with attachment? Attachment is exaggerating the good qualities of something and thinking that they're good in and of themselves from their own side. I'm angry. I think that this thing is negative and I want it away from me. That has no relationship to attachment. But if you trace it back, usually you had an attachment that didn't work. And because it was thwarted, you're angry. Yeah, so you were attached to say reputation and respect and you went to work expecting reputation and respect because you're a well educated intelligent person who has this and this and this qualification and you come to the workplace and you don't get any respect and you don't get any appreciation and now you are pissed off. Yeah, do you see that its root was attachment. Yeah, if you didn't have attachment to reputation, you wouldn't be angry at disrespect. Yeah. Or, um, you know, if you were in traffic and you're getting really stressed out about the traffic, which none of us are right now because there is no traffic right now, but <laughs> the times when there is traffic, if, we're, if you're really stressed out in traffic, you know, it's usually related to attachment to getting to where you want to go in the time that you want to get there with an image in, of your, in your mind of traffic in that area at its best. So you take, you know, this kind of framework of that one day the traffic wasn't so bad. That's the way I'd like it to be now. That's the way it should be now. And then it isn't. And you're mad. Right. And you very rarely step back and ask yourself, is what I'm saying to myself about expectations even possible or true? Yeah, it was possible and true like once. Right? And then you're taking that as, that is the right way, that is the truth of it, and you're holding on to that as reality, even though it's never repeated itself. Do you know what I mean? Right? So the desire realm, you know, and in particular the humans of, of the desire realm, if you track back most negative emotions, their root is attachment. Um, same with pride, same with jealousy, same with all the negative states of mind. They're usually flaring up from being attached to something. What you were attached to didn't happen the way you wanted it to. And now your response is anger, pride, jealousy, etc. cetera. Um, do you agree? Do you reckon that, that, that that's a big piece of the discontent and the stress in your life if you were to pull it to the root, there was an attachment to something that didn't work out the way you wanted it to? No, I wanted to say that um, it feels like uh, most of the time like an anxiety, but it's like the desire and the attachment, but it feels like a really big anxiety, I think most of the time in, in our life for me and that that causes me a lot of stress and a lot of pain and that's it. yeah I, I think you're right it, 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 it what it is is attachment what it feels like is anxiety yeah what is anxiety anyway you know i hope this happens i hope that doesn't happen i hope this happens i hope that doesn't happen back and forth hope and fear hope and fear you know agitated agitated yeah tall I was thinking to myself that actually everything you've described has to do with wanting to control everything, control uh, the reactions, control the gratitude or non-gratitude. You know, the fact that we seem to think that we have control over everything or anything is somewhat the root of all <laughs> these things, you know. We are attached to controlling. <laughs> That's how I see it, you know. If we say, okay, I have no control over anything, you know, everything that comes my way is what I'll deal with. I find it helpful, you know, to, to not be attached to situations, reactions and stuff. Yeah I, I, yeah, I think there's, um, there's an important insight in there. It, I think that you're right that a lot of our struggle is the illusion of control. Um, but I think another piece of it is that we are trying to control the things we don't have control over. 
but we're not trying to control the things we do have control over. What do we have control over? A degree of our mental state. Not 100% control over our mind, but we do have some more control over our mind than we give ourselves credit for. So instead of thinking, first step, what is my mind doing? What can I control about my mind? We don't do that. The first thing we do is to try and control the conditions, isn't it? Yeah? And the conditions should always be secondary, you know, it, unless it's an emergency situation, right? Right? Like if a car is about to hit you, you don't think, oh, I should really control my mind and be peaceful. No, first try to avoid the other car. But, you know, generally speaking, the mind is the main thing. And yet that is not the main emphasis. So yeah, it's boiling. I think that control is a huge piece of this, but it's like we're trying to put all this effort into the things we don't have control over. And if we would let go, there would be a huge relief. But that doesn't mean let going of the whole concept of control. You can control your mind. Um, it's just requires a little bit of mental space to remember that you can. Yeah, because most of the time we can't control our mind because we're too distracted, right? We're too distracted to exercise the control that we have. Yeah, so, you know, the very simplest of meditations that we all know how to do, just a basic breathing meditation, we don't give ourselves permission to do them throughout the day because it feels like we're wasting time. When in fact, if you did five minutes or 10 minutes of breathing meditation every two hours, you would have a very efficient, very joyful day with a lot more mindfulness and control. Yeah, but instead we think, I don't have time to meditate, I have to do this, I have to do that. When in fact, that very mind of hyper controlling about conditions makes you less efficient. Yeah, and then less satisfied with the results as well because you were you know, trying to manipulate the outside rather than organize the inside. Yeah, I don't know, attachment is a really important piece. Control is a really important piece. Um, and if you can trace back the relationship between those two with any present moment suffering, I think that sometimes your wisdom will then help you release right in that moment. Yeah, so if you're very angry about something or you're very um, triggered in some way, if you can ask yourself, what did I think should have happened? What did I expect would have happened? And then ask yourself, was that as possible as I held on to it to be? Was that something that could have actually happened or was it just something that happened once in my life, twice in my life, and now I'm trying to get it to repeat itself? when I actually don't have control over enough conditions to make it repeat itself. And even deeper than that, why do I think I need it? Yeah, why, why do I think I need validation and respect in order to be happy? Why do I think I need a certain level of material comfort in order to be happy? Why do I think I need a certain kind of this or that or this or that? You know, why do I think that that is necessary component of my happiness? You know, was it just something that I was taught? It was it just something that society said that I need? Was it just, you know, a lie of capitalism, etc.? You know, did I just believe the advertising, right? Did I just believe the samsara advertising? Um, you know, because recognizing that shouldn't make you sad, it should make you free. You realize all of that was just false advertising. If I don't need any of that, oh my gosh, my life is open to me again. Possibilities are open to me again. Yeah, it can really help. Yeah, okay, so human beings are dominated, dominated by desire. This is not news to us, but if we can remember that it's at the root of most of our drama, most of our stress, most of our mistakes. Yeah, most of our mistakes are related to desirous attachment. This is really helpful. All our unfortunate shopping purchases, all of our unfortunate relationship choices, all of our silly family arguments, all of it, there is an attachment to something that is completely unreasonable at its root, but we've believed the lie of attachment. Yeah. Okay, so then um, the hungry ghosts, um, their main disturbing emotion is miserliness, which is related to attachment but it's got a lot more of a insatiable, starving quality. 
So in, um, in a more human sense, we would say this is like the mind of an animal. What is the word that you say? I didn't understand it in Hebrew. What is the main? Oh, uh, miserliness means like to, um, somebody can type it into the chat in Hebrew, but basically it's like hoarding or holding <laughs> on to what you have, not wanting to share. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not a word we use in English colloquially that often. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's this real feeling of the things I have, I cannot share. The things I have are not enough. Both. I cannot share and it's not enough. And I need more and I need more and I need more. So it's, it's a mind of an addict. Um, and so if you're a, a human being with addictions, then it's very likely that your next life you'd be reborn as a hungry ghost because it's just the continuation of that habit. Yeah. So, you know, we might not be um, obvious addicts, um, but it's important to ask ourselves what socially acceptable addictions do we have and how are they creating dysfunction in our life, right? So we might not be shooting up heroin, but there are things that we're really atta attached to, especially when the hook is in. Yeah, it's like attachment that got out of control, Nizan is saying, exactly. Yeah, it's like, um, you know, say that you want to watch something on Netflix <laughs> because you've had a long day at work, okay? Totally fine, watch something on Netflix, you've had a long day at work. Now that's, you know, attachment because attachment is exaggerating the good qualities of entertainment and saying that you will find happiness and relaxation from this activity from its own side. It's attachment, but it's not the end of the world attachment. And if it's just attachment and it's not gone into hungry ghost thinking, you could watch one episode, finish it, stand up, make a cup of tea, go back to work or have a conversation, go for a walk, do some meditation. Done. If addiction thinking has gotten in, you watch one episode and then you must watch the next one. Not I'd like to, not maybe tomorrow, but I must watch the next one now. It has that like hungry, starving quality. And you might wind up watching then another one and another one and another one. And at the end of your binge, you're not actually happier, right? Usually you're tired and slightly discontent Occasionally you're uplifted and like, oh, what a great adventure I just watched. But I think that most of the time, um, you know, five episodes doesn't equal five times more happiness. Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? So this is when it's like shifted from regular attachment into like addiction. Yeah. So when we're, um, when we're noticing this tendency in ourselves, the easiest thing to do to interrupt it is just find an interruption. Doesn't have to be anything special. Get up and go to the bathroom. Yeah, get up and stretch for a minute. Sometimes that breaks the spell. It is, it's like a spell. It's like you're under some sort of hypno hypnosis. Um, and so if whatever the activity is where you've got this starving quality, I must have more of this. And it's got this real agitated hungriness. If you can say, if that's still true in 10 minutes of doing something else, maybe I'll look at it. But if you do 10 minutes of something else and then ask yourself, do you still need that thing, whatever it is, usually the spell is broken and you don't have to. Do you, do you know this experience? Yeah, Dal. Yeah, it sounds like a very compulsive behavior, you know, a disorder. That well, is driven by anxiety, you know, maybe. We can see it now with the toilet paper, for example. I'm not joking, you know, with the everyone just grabs whatever they can. They don't stop to think about others. It's a very good example when you're really, you know, compulsive about something and... Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, different things will trigger it. There's kind of like our normal everyday manageable amount of attachment that's just kind of causing a bit of trouble all the time, but not like horribly. And we are sort of like functional addicts. 
right? And then there's when it tips into crazy town, right? But when it tips, it still might be socially acceptable. So no one's going to call us on it, but it's actually creating a really unfortunate pattern in your mind. Um, it, you know, it can happen with something that everyone else would say is good. Say you get lost in a book, right? So you're reading a book and you're enjoying the book. And then it's, you know, you look at the clock and you realize it's, you know, 11 o'clock at night. And you think, I just need to read one more chapter. I just need to read one more chapter. And then it's two in the morning and three in the morning and you know, you finish the book and your eyes are exhausted and now you won't be able to get a full night's sleep. The person in bed next to you or your friend that you tell later might say, oh, that's so cool. You really love to read. Aren't you a smart person that loves reading so much? You know, society might not look down on you for that, right? It could be a profound book. It could be um, a benign book. You know, it could be something like Plato. It could be something like architecture. It doesn't have to be, you know, a fluffy novel, but it doesn't actually matter the content if your mind got hungry. Yeah, your mind got that like, I must, I must, I must. That is not a good pattern for us. And we, we see, you know, decreasing returns where actually the more you feed that illusion of happiness, the less happiness you have. Yeah, if you had told yourself, actually, I'm going to go to bed at 11. And now tomorrow I'll read some, then the next day reading might actually be more pleasurable than if you'd forced yourself to finish it that night because of your hungry driving mind, right? Um, the hungry driving mind might make you read um, quicker. And Chucky's asking about what about hunger for Dharma? We can get attached to our idea of what Dharma can do. We can't get attached to Dharma because its qualities can't be exaggerated, but we can get it attached to ourselves as the Dharma experiencer or Dharma student. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky with Dharma, but um, if it's agitating your mind, that's the, that's the question. If it's soothing your mind, an affliction isn't as present. If it's agitating your mind, you've turned a god into a demon and the very good thing is turned into poison. Yeah, enough? Um, my question is uh, about what we've talked about before and also related to this topic that you tend to say to yourself that when you have time you practice but you also practice when you're busy is it really true i always ask myself is it really true that we need to get away from the situation or not to be in such an intensive situation in order to practice well i mean there's there's um there's logic in being in retreat you're not in the city you're not involved in work there's less intensity but also when you're not in a retreat and things are less busy you tend to be lazy as you said before so um, i i i just sort of um confused about what is the um the optimized um, situation to practice dharma and what is the best conditions to do so and yeah. also related to shuki's uh, question about you know what about hunger to dharma and uh, how much time do we need to spend on it and yeah it, it's it's so tricky because the the contents aren't necessarily something you can point to as positive or negative it's the mind or the motivation you bring to it so if your mind is agitated that's the that's the thing that should make us say i've gone to the dark side if the mind is agitated right but so taking taking it back to your first question though about kind of what are the best conditions to practice you don't need to retreat in order to practice, but there needs to be an understanding that real retreat is mental, right? And so you could be in the cave and it not be a retreat. You could be in the household and it be a retreat. It's about the mind, right? So what you're retreating from is negative states of mind, but the way in which you retreat from negative states of mind might be that you separate from the conditions that normally bring it up. So you're not blaming the conditions, but you're acknowledging that conditions have an impact. So in the 12 links, number six, contact, 
basically the outside meeting the inside gives rise to a feeling if there are certain conditions that always are a condition for certain types of negative experiences you need to separate from them sometimes to break the pattern and to get some objectivity about them and then you enter back into that same situation with more spaciousness logic clarity so the whole point of any kind of retreat is to be able to go out of retreat yeah so you're going into retreat to build new skills to strengthen the skills you already have, to deepen your understanding and awareness so that you can take that and bring it back into ordinary life without getting hooked by the same dramas that you used to get hooked by. So it doesn't mean that you don't have any dramas. It means you're not pulled off course by them anymore because you've had enough space to kind of reassess what they actually are. So of course, some lives are too distracting to do practice, but often our lives become distracting because we're avoiding practice and how confronting it is. You know? So it might be that you're um, about to sit down and meditate during the day, and right before you sit down, you suddenly need to make a cup of tea or a phone call, right? You finally have time and space in the day. You're ready to do it. You've planned on doing it. And right before you sit down, something else becomes really important. This happens so often, doesn't it? And it's that, you know, the ego fears its annihilation. And so it's going to say, quick, do something else. I don't want to be confronted. I guess don't get lost in the idea that you have to have some sort of fancy monastic life or some fancy dharma bum traveler life or that you have to be single or that you have to not have kids in the house or that you can't work or something you, you know you don't have to live any kind of special life to have a better dharma practice but all of us monks and nuns lay people people with kids people with pets people with jobs everybody needs to look at what distracts me what distracts me and it's not the fault of whatever distracts you. It's that you've given power to certain things to pull you off center. What are the things you've given permission to pull off center? And can you retreat from those or disengage from those? You know what I mean? So it's like if you're in between two activities in a day, do you naturally just fill in all the space with something else? Or do you allow yourself the space to recover from what's just happened to revive your mental clarity, and then to act with mindfulness the next chapter. Usually if we have two activities in a day and 10 minutes in between, then we're reading something in between. Yeah, or we're busy, busy, busy. We're filling up the space, even if there is the space, because we're so used to being stimulated. And the mind freaks out the first few minutes that it's not stimulated. And so if you know that, then you can plan for it. So, you know, you've got 10 minutes between things. You know that the first minute you sit still, the mind is gonna race. It's gonna race and say, read this article, check your emails, look at your texts, go do this, do some exercise, eat something, I don't know, fill in the space, you know, listen to music, quick. The first minute, that's what your mind's gonna do, right? It's gonna freak out with the space it's found itself in. And if you just say, all right, I'm gonna freak out for a minute. Let's just sit here on the couch and freak out. Yeah, just let yourself freak out and try not to indulge it by saying, I have to keep stimulated. Yeah, say, so what if for once I tried something different? <sighs> All right, I'm just going to be a little bit wound up for a minute and I'm going to let it settle down. And then after a minute or so, I'm going to try and focus on the breath. Not tight, not strict, not with tension. But with some clarity, I'm just going to ride it, you know, like a surfer rides a wave, right? I'm just going to ride it in and ride it out. And all of my other thoughts, I'm just going to let them do what they want, but I'm not going to give them any attention. I'm going to treat them like noisy neighbor children, acknowledge that they're there, but then bring my focus back. Yeah, I'm just going to do that instead. Yeah, I'm not going to fill up the space because if you don't fill up the space, you give yourself a chance to recover. If you don't fill up the space, then you give yourself a chance for your wisdom to come back up and your motivation to become clearer. And then the next chapter in the day is more centered and less stressful. Yeah. 
so it's, it's about kind of injecting little mini retreats into the day. And then if you can inject a longer retreat into the life, it's going to be great. But we, we need to give ourselves a chance to develop the states of mind that will allow us to even retreat. Because I know a lot of people who spend a lot of time and thought thinking about the retreat that they want to do without actually letting go of distractions first. You know, it seems like planning for a retreat is saving up money or looking for the right one. Planning for retreat is actually letting go of desire. Because if you don't let go of a certain degree of desire and then you go into retreat, you'll have a panic attack, freak out and leave. Yeah, and trust me, I've seen it again and again, where people come into the retreat with so much attachment about what it should do and how it will work and who they will be, that they put all this pressure on themselves. It's way too intense, it's way too much, and it's so different than their normal life that they burn out after a few days. And it's really human and it's really natural, but it's because they've prepared for retreat in the wrong way. They've prepared financially or they've prepared intellectually, but actually the main preparation is to let go of daily desires. Yeah, just gently, you know, just getting a handle on them. It's not like you get rid of all of them, but you get a little bit more on top of not needing to run towards every kind of stimuli in the day. Yeah, because what will happen if you suddenly have space, but no more stimuli, your mind's freak out time is going to be a lot longer. Yeah, that one minute of freak out in between one chapter and another in the day is going to stretch and you're just going to be bouncing off the walls the first week of your retreat. Yeah, some people have breakdowns. Yeah, because their mind is so used to being stimulated, then suddenly there's not the same external stimulation. So their mind goes into overdrive trying to keep it stimulated but then there's nothing to read and nothing to do and it just implodes so you know so just really gently what can i do to have little micro tiny retreats in my day yeah to just you know remember that the main thing is continuity yeah in practice what we want is continuous effort that gradually builds strength rather than a big burst and then recovery, and then a big burst and then recovery, it's not actually effective because then what you're really doing is treating the spiritual path like another form of entertainment. So you'll have like this peak experience and maybe you're prepared enough to enjoy your retreat and you put a lot of effort and time and it's really interesting and beautiful, but then what happens after? What are you able to pull from your retreat back into your daily life? Um, you know, I, I remember when I was first ordained, I used to ask my teacher, should I do this retreat now? Am I ready to do this retreat now? And I was like, now is it time? Now is it time? And he said, well, what are you doing today? <laughs> today, what are you doing? And I'd be like, oh, well, you know, I'm just doing this little practice and that little practice. And he'd say, good, do those better. <laughs> just keep doing those that you're already doing. Keep doing those better, <laughs> right? And then if sometime you're able to do a retreat, try to do it a retreat on what you already do so that it's stronger and richer. And then you go back to your daily life practice and it's got more life to it. So then, you know, structured, organized retreat is about giving more life to your daily practice. It's not about escaping from life. Does that make sense? So just really gently, what are the distractions I can start to let go of, you know, and don't, don't do it in a mean way. Don't do it in a punishing deprivation way. Feel like it's freeing yourself from what you didn't need. You know, like a little kid letting go of habits that they don't need anymore. You know, it was nice to believe in Santa Claus until it wasn't necessary anymore. You guys don't have Santa Claus, but you know what I mean, right? <laughs> You know, it's like that was, a, that was a nice kind of samsaric comfort until it no longer made sense. And then you let it go, you know, and now, you know, and now it's gone. It's okay. 
look, you know, just, just be gentle with yourself about it. One, because the way you speak to yourself becomes the way you speak to others. So if you're harsh with yourself, then even if you're polite to others, there's a harshness and a judgmentalness in how you are with other people, right? So how you talk to yourself is your training ground for how you speak to others. That's really important. But the other thing is, if you're too harsh with yourself and you try to you know, pull away all your samsaric pleasures all at once, you'll have a backlash and a rebellion. Yeah, you'll, you'll be able to do it for a while, then you'll feel sad, then you'll get mad at yourself or mad at the Dharma, or you'll get sad at yourself and disillusioned with the Dharma. So it's about pacing and knowing what is your actual capability. Yeah, pacing, pacing, pacing. Yes, yeah, just really gently. So if you think about a good day when you're less afflicted, you know, try and have more of those days. And then that becomes your baseline. And then you're able to have a few better days than that. You reach for those and that becomes your baseline, you know, just gradually like that. And sometimes you'll slip and you'll be just as bad as you ever were. You'll be just as angry, just as grumpy, just as horrible to people as you were 20 years ago. And you'll feel so disappointed in yourself and think, I've been a Dharma practitioner for decades. What's wrong with me? You're forgetting that that horrible version of you happens less often. Yeah, we sometimes expect that it's never going to happen again. What's actually happening with Dharma practice is that the sad version or the mad version is just happening less and less frequently. Not that it's gone, right? So less frequently is great news. It's great news for you. It's great news for your family. Yeah, but if you take the fact that sometimes you still slide back into your old habits as some sort of proof of deficiencies, you know, that's, that's really not the case. Yeah? Think, okay, this is as bad as I once was, but how often am I like this? Not very often, actually. Thank goodness. Does it make sense? Right? It's, it's about, you know, our approach to the spiritual path is as important as the spiritual path. Yeah, our approach, you know, how are, how are we speaking to ourselves about what we're doing? There's what we're doing, <laughs> and then there's the commentary and the narrative over the top of it. And that is as important, you know, they're intermingled. So, you know, I always think to myself, is how I'm talking to myself and how I'm living a way I will want to talk to myself and live in future lives? Because who knows what the conditions will be and what the context will be, but what I'm carrying with me is my mental habits. So I want a mental habit that takes joy in transformation, right? I want a mental habit that takes joy in altruism. So if I'm forcing things farther and stronger than I'm actually able to, then I'm gonna have like a weariness or a disillusionment when I need a spiritual path again. I'm gonna feel some sort of like self-hatred or you know, annoyance with religion, or I'm gonna have all these issues in my next life if I don't deal with my habits now and organize them in a way where however far I go or don't go, the main thing is, am I loving it enough to continue? It doesn't mean I have to be jumping up and down excited. It doesn't mean I have to be bubbling over with joy. It means that there's a deep contentment. Yeah, a deep satisfaction that this work is worth doing and this is the purpose of my life. Yeah, so it's like a deep happiness, even if you have a bad day or whatever, it doesn't matter because there's like this deep satisfaction that you've found a path, that life can make sense now. Yeah, that there is work worth doing and it's not the work you do for money necessarily, but you can bring your spiritual path to that work and then any work is meaningful. You know, you could be a coffee barista for the rest of your life and your whole family is just crying at your lack of ambition and thinks that you're a total waste of space. And you can be like, you know what? I am a fantastic barista because all my customers are happy after they leave me. You know, you could be a fancy lawyer or a fancy doctor or whatever fancy thing your family would prefer you to be, but absolutely hell to live with. What's the point? So this is what we want to think about a bit. Um, then, uh, okay, we have animal realm and hell realm, so I'll do those, those quickly after lunch. Um, but uh, are there any questions about the first four or um, ideas that popped up before we stop for some lunch?
Great. Okay. All right. So um, we'll we'll have uh, an hour for lunch.